And um, I think in terms of communicating Bulgaria to the wider world, there is, yes, there's a value in the local grape varieties, but I also believe quite strongly that there's a value in international grape varieties in helping people to um, understand where Bulgaria is as a country in, in global terms. Because, you know, trying to sell people a Mavrod or a Rubin when they've never heard of it and they're not really sure that Bulgaria has, has a, is a winemaking country and so on, is sometimes it's actually quite a big ask. So... Um, and the reality is there are a lot of international grape varieties planted in Bulgaria. Um, I, mean, I think at one time Bulgaria had more Cabernet than France did. You know, um, don't think that's, that's true anymore because the vineyard area in, in Bulgaria is now quite a lot smaller than it used to be. I mean, it's down to um, around 54,000 hectares um, nowadays, give or take. Um, and not all of that is in commercial production. The harvested area in, in 2011, for instance, was 46,000 hectares, which makes Bulgaria, uh, say, a much, much smaller country than it used to be back in the days of, of um, massive volumes of Bulgarian Cabernet Sauvignon in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, um, so, yeah, so three different grape varieties, obviously a Pinot Noir, a Cabernet Sauvignon, because you can't do a Bulgarian tasting without showing you what the Bulgarian Cabernet does nowadays, um, and a Cabernet Franc. So, I mean, first of all, Pinot Noir, I think, um, interesting grape variety for, you know, winemakers fall in love with it. And in this particular case, the winemaker spent three years working in New Zealand and fell in love with Pinot Noir. Um, and this particular winery, Villa Justina, was actually set up by um, a guy who imports and ma who manufactures winemaking equipment. So he first set up the winery actually as a showcase for his equipment. Um, but then has got incredibly passionate about wine. So it's, it's much, much, you know, having started as a white equipment showcase, it's now definitely, you know, a winery and wine is its raison d'etre. So it's got a team of actually four winemakers. And again, I was just talking to um, Keith over here about the influence of international consultants and things. And what I was saying was, yes, there are a couple of, you know, Michel Roland is consulting in Bulgaria, Mark Dworkin is consulting in Bulgaria, but um, it's also, I think, particularly encouraging to see the Bulgarians sending their winemakers out to explore and to train in other countries. And open their minds to what the global market is looking for in wine and not just what the local market is looking for in wine because there is a bit of a tendency for Bulgarians to like their reds pretty chunky. High alcohol, high tannin, high oak, high everything really. Um, um, and, you know, it's not a sole um, Bulgarian factor. It's something that I see quite a lot across Eastern Europe as people go from big volume wines to high quality wines, the association in reds particularly, cutting the yields down, raising the alcohol, making the fruit riper, throwing the oak at it, throwing the extract at it, I think is a phase that has to be gone through in developing a quality industry. Um, but a couple of things I say I think have happened in Bulgaria recently. One is that, um, you know, there's more of a wine culture. So not everybody is starting their meal with rakia and killing their taste buds nowadays. So that's a big improvement, I think. And they have banned smoking in restaurants, which I also think, you know, certainly has done my lungs a lot of good. Bulgarians smoke so heavily, you would sit down to eat and people would be taking a puff of a cigarette, nasty Bulgarian tobacco as well, and a mouthful of food. And it was just... So I think that that stopped people appreciating subtlety in their wines. But since the air has become clear, there is scope for people to both understand that the, the wider world is looking for balance and drinkability in their wines... Um, and say so with a wine, with a food culture developing, and the younger generation travelling more and tasting more and being more open-minded. Again, I think we're starting to see that reflected in the wines. So, in this particular Pinot Noir, I think again you can see 
the guys trained in New Zealand in the style of the wine. There's no oak here at all. It's all um, just about focusing on the fruit. Um, extended maceration, um, three different clones in the vineyards, and so no oak, so pure fruit here. Um, this little wine uh, estate is about 26 kilometers from Plovdiv again, and it's in a sandwich between the Rodopi Mountains and uh, the Balkan Mountains, so you get a lot of mountain breezes, so some coolness in the air. Um, which is something that's really important for Pinot Noir, particularly that nighttime coolness. Um, then we're going on to a Cabernet Sauvignon from um, down in the south of the country. Again, Danube Plain for all three of these. No, sorry, Thracian Lowlands. Thracian Lowlands, sorry, Julia. <laughs> Thracian Lowlands for all three of these, yes. So uh, Chateau Colorovo is actually down in the south of the country, just next to the, the famous Michel Roland project at Castra Rubra. Um, and they haven't been going for very long at all. Um, only crushing about 2009 they started. So again, I'm saying, you know, this is still a very young industry in its current form. Um, they have 25 hectares, but they've bought old vineyards rather than planting their own, which again is that balance between do you have the new vineyards and denser plantings and things, or do you have the, the benefit of older vineyards where you've got a natural balance to the, to, to the vines, even if they were planted on the old Soviet, you know, the old communist big cordon system. There's a, and I, I actually think that the old vines factor does show through quite nicely in this wine. Um, and then you've got 16 months in a mixture of French and Bulgarian oak here. So, so um, but, but Cabernet Sauvignon's been such an important thing for Bulgaria. You need to see a good example of where Bulgaria is now with this. Um, and then the third one, Cabernet Franc, fascinating grape variety, I think, in, in, in warmer regions in Eastern Europe. Um, some really exciting Cabernet Francs, for instance, in Vilain in the south of Hungary near the Croatian border. Um, and I think it's a really interesting grape variety in, in, Bul in Bulgaria as well because it kind of retains a freshness about it that sometimes Cabernet Sauvignon doesn't. So I think there's some really interesting wines being made from Cabernet Franc. So with Sintica, the third one, we're down again in the Struma Valley, down in the southwest of the country, that warm region I mentioned. And this winery was actually set up in a former research station. The research station that produced things like uh, Melnick 55. So... Um, so it's kind of quite a nice bit of karma that this research station has now become a winery with a little uh, botanic garden around it. And as it was set up to really focus on high quality wines and wines that would be able to age. So I think it's quite interesting to see going back to 2008 to see, you know, some keep, keeping potential in Bulgarian wine. Yeah, the research station was cut, uh, was closed down after the change of regime, so maybe even before that. Could you say something about Bulgarian oak? Does it, give, does it, taste, does it taste influence more like French oak? Um, I find Bulgarian oak quite distinctive. I think it has a kind of um, balsamic character that is quite... Um, is more obvious. I think it's a... Personally, I think it's a less subtle oak than French oak. So I'm kind of quite encouraged that when people are... And I understand that people want to use local oak to, you know, build on that sense of place. Um, but it's nice to see, I think, people using slightly bigger barrels, 300, 400 litre barrels, to sort of counteract the really strong personality of Bulgarian oak, personally. <laughs> Same species, but obviously much more continental forests. So hotter summers, very cold winters, even very cold springs. They had like three feet of snow in March. Um, and then also the seasoning of the oak is sort of is happening in this, again, quite continental climate, quite a dry climate. So that's, that's an interesting factor. But yeah, but it is the same species. But obviously terroir comes into oak growing as well as into uh, grape growing. So over to the guys to talk about the wines. <laughs> well, since uh, Richard's 
um, gone through them before. I just ha say a very few words about how they appeared to me. Um, I quite like that Pinot Noir. Very quite a, quite a dark colour, black cherry nose, good natural ripeness, quite fleshy, um, southern style. I mean, uh, softer and warmer than a Burgundy, and it's obviously as Caroline says, it's more Central Otago influence. And I like the fact it it didn't have any oak. So I think that's a really nice <clears throat> example. Um, the Cabernet Sauvignon, um, as Caroline said, is a bit chunky. It was remark remembered Michael Broadbent's expression "four square." Um, good fruit, but it's 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 a bit it's a bit raw. It's a bit earthy. I can certainly imagine it with a goulash, but it needs something pretty chunky to drink uh, to eat with it. Um, and I think that's probably a work in progress. I, I think they they. They don't have to lose the Bulgarianness about it, but it's a little bit out of step with Cabernet Sauvignon around the world at the moment. And the Cabernet Franc, much as I love Cabernet Franc, I was rather disappointed in this because it's it's a bit cooked and a bit burnt, and I think the the freshness and fragrance of Cabernet Franc has been allowed to uh, get a little bit too mature. And to me, there's not much life left in that. Um, so, I'll pass you to Richard. Who will disagree? I will on the Cabernet Franc, anyway. Um, I, the, these, these wines we selected because we felt that all three of them showed the grape varieties relatively faithfully without too much oak influence. And as Caroline said earlier, that there is a danger when you're making premium wines in countries like Bulgaria to to think that throwing oak at it is the secret, which obviously it, in most cases it probably isn't. And I like the fact that all of these showed, to my mind, some varietal character. And the Cabernet Franc, I agree it's mature, and I, I, it, it looks and tastes as if it's quite high in alcohol, but I thought it retained its fragrance. And uh, I thought for a mature wine, that was quite a, a almost sort of aristocratic Cabernet Franc in the way it came across. Um, I, I like the fragrance of that, but may, maybe I, I sort of, uh, I, I think as I get older, I like older wines more, which is curious. Freud would have lots to say about that, I'm sure. Um, the Cabernet Sauvignon, I, I've, I've got less to say about, I do agree with Stephen, I find it, I think it's very challenging for a country like Bulgaria to compete with Sauvignon, with Cabernet Sauvignon, given what is pre being produced everywhere else in the world. Um, if I was advising them, I would say, by all means, grow Cabernet and see what you can do, but, but don't depend on it, because there is always going to be so much competition. Um, it is a fantastic grape, and people all around the world are producing wonderful examples. And the Pinot Noir, I agree totally with Stephen and Caroline, I, I think that's lovely, pure, bright Pinot Noir, which could hold its own against um, oaked versions of Pinot. From, from many parts of the world, really nicely done. And again, a bit like that, uh, um, the Muscat, the, the, the Tamianca we started with, this is from the southwest of the country, this is from a very hot region, but it doesn't show that in the wine. The wine really, there's a, there's a warmth to it, but it retains the freshness really well. I think very nicely. Well.